So as we begin to get ready to sit together for half an hour, I first of all would just really invite you to take a moment to connect with your intention for this evening, connect with what matters. And I also would really like you to be sure that you invite every part of yourself into the practice. No part needs to be left out. So assume a position that's comfortable and let's begin. Just bring a kindly attention to the body. And just take a moment to appreciate this body that, that we have. Each of us, our old friend, our faithful vehicle. And just be with the body sitting. And appreciate how it is that when we come together, just as the body supports us, we give support to each other. And we get support from each other. And really feel yourself being welcomed in this space. Whoever you are, no matter what your story is, you belong here. And let's see this evening if we can practice with our whole selves. Not needing to be the good meditator. Not needing to get it right. So often in our practice, we can find ourselves almost unconsciously striving, feeling that we have to live up to something, that we have to be good meditators. And just really see if as an experiment this evening, you can just be with this body and this mind in a really open, and relaxed way. See if it's possible to have a relaxed and kindly awareness Mindfulness is being aware of the present moment's experience, just as it is. So we can relax into that. And when the stories or judgments appear, we can relax around that too. That's what we're aware of. That's how it is right now.
really trust your own instincts. Trust yourself, this body, this mind. If it's important to use the breath as a support, do that. If it's helpful to practice with the visualization of body like mountain, breath like ocean, mind like sky, welcome that. Let this time together, this time in silence, be a time of deep acceptance and relaxation. Enjoying our practice if we can. At least being open to the possibility of enjoying our practice. And as we rest into our practice, we can rest into the support we get from and give each other. The beauty of that shared aspiration to be in harmony. So let's practice in silence for a while.
And for the last few minutes of our formal meditation, I would encourage you to see if you can bring about a felt sense of gratitude or appreciation. And just really let your mindfulness be with that awareness, how that resonates in the mind and in the body. A felt sense of gratitude or appreciation or even loving kindness. Welcome everyone. Uh, just take a minute to do a little stretching. Um, let the body feel feel good. Take a little drink if you need it. And if you're willing to um, put your cameras on and be a little tile for a minute or two, just so we all can see each other, make visual contact. And I'm Patrice, and I am here not far from the Common Ground building here in the Seward neighborhood, which is on the ancestral and contemporary uh, homelands of the Dakota, very close to the most sacred place in all Dakota cosmology, which is um, the Bedote, which is the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota uh, rivers. It is, um, it is the site of creation for the Dakota. So we live in a very, very sacred place here. So what I'd like to talk about tonight, I know Shelley has been working uh, roughly with Sharon Salzberg's wonderful book, Faith. Um, but I thought tonight I would share with you something that I've been working on in my practice, working with in my practice for a while. And I'm hoping that we can have a discussion about this because um, I would love to know how other people practice with this. Um, so I want to talk tonight about the precepts and I want to talk about a way in which I've been adapting um, the precepts. Um, and the precepts are the um, guidance for ethical behavior. And the reason why I have been working with this is um, Shortly after 
the murder of George Floyd when my neighborhood, as many neighborhoods, was really in crisis. And every morning I would get up and I would walk the eight blocks to common ground to see if it was still standing because the bar kitty corner from common ground was just cinders. And it was a, a, just a, a, a really, um, just such a difficult, heartbreaking time for everybody and a time of a lot of um, fear and anxiety. And I was reading Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And Kendi said, um, you know, critiquing racism is not activism. Uh, changing minds is not activism. An activist is someone who produces power and changes policy. And you know, I've always thought of myself as an activist. And um, I am old enough that I, you know, I was an activist during the Vietnam War when I actually had to show the National Guard my student ID to get on campus. I'm very active in the women's movement. I mean, I've thought about myself as an activist. But after reading Ibram Kendi, um, I really decided I needed to make much more of a public political commitment. And um, so I decided to work really seriously around issues of, of public safety and reforming it. So I got very much involved in, um, in electoral politics. And what was so challenging for me in bringing my, um, sort of my spiritual life to my politics is the whole difficulty of um, sort of the polarizing in, uh, in political discourse, the us versus them. And I really wanted to figure out how I could be completely wholeheartedly engaged in working for what I believed in, where there were really clear opponents, people who were opposed to my positions, and how to do that in a way that I didn't demonize the opponents. Um, I, I would do it in with the hope of um, possible reconciliation at some future, but it was really about not throwing anyone out of my heart, even when I completely disagreed with them, and even when I thought they were misrepresenting the position that I held. And uh, I did a lot of um, door knocking, phone banking, presenting to um, civic groups, and uh, was made a very conscious decision to be um, a public person kind of representing the progressive older white voter. Okay, that, that was kind of my, my key demographic that I was going to, to work on. So I really came back to my Buddhist training um, to work with how I was going to, to do this. And I've always found the five Buddhist trainings on non-harming really useful. And in their simplest form, <clears throat> they are refraining from intentional harm, refraining from not taking anything that's not given freely. You know, sometimes it's don't, don't kill, don't steal, but really don't kill is, is about non-harming, not, not causing intentional harm. Not stealing can really be understood as not taking anything that's not freely given. Um, refraining from misusing sexuality, which is all about our energy. Refraining from false or injurious speech. And the last one is refraining from consuming entities that cloud the mind and lead to carelessness. Sometimes people say you know, it's about avoiding intoxicants, but it's not just 
um, physical substance uh, intoxicants, not just substances, but anything that um, clouds the mind and leads to, to a kind of carelessness. So I worked with reworking these uh, precepts in ways that I thought were useful for being um, a political activist. And the first one was to begin with the intention of not harming self and other, even as I would engage with hurt and trauma. And it meant that to not harm myself or harm others, it was really essential to take into account both the sort of personal and the um, communal history of hurt and trauma. And um, so that I would, would understand um, my own hurt, my own trauma around things, what the history of that was, and then also to take into account that the persons who were my opponents also had their own histories of hurt, trauma, their own reasons for acting the way they, they did, and um, to recognize that we all sometimes act out of um, greed and fear and delusion. Um, and that sort of made a little more space for compassion. But it also seemed to me at the same time that it was really essential to stay attuned to the systemic nature of harm in so many of our, um, our institutions to um, really, especially here in Minneapolis where racial disparities in every sector, income, education, healthcare, housing, rates of incarceration, it is you know, the ongoing legacy of um, white wealth and um, white wealth accruing essentially from land and labor theft. So that there was also that context. When we think about harming and not harming to take into account some of the harm that has already been done. So that was sort of the first um, way of working with this the precepts was to have this kind of larger sense to realize that it wasn't my intention to harm myself or others, but to also put it in a context of a lot of harm had been done and really trying to understand that harm. The second precept, which is um, sometimes talked about as not taking anything that's not freely given. I resolve not to take anything that is not my own including any projections I might think another holds. And this is really about not taking things personally. Um, and it was also about avoiding moral injury. And moral injury is a psychological concept and it's the damage that happens to um, people when their own sense of integrity or values is is violated or they they passively um, uh, passively accept uh, things that that do violate their own moral sense of, of integrity so it was this the second precept not taking anything that's not not my own um, was was really about not taking things personally and being really attuned to a moral injury, not doing anything, not taking anything in that would violate my own sense of, of integrity. Um, and um, one of the, the areas that I worked on personally with this is to just really notice the chatter in my mind, like when I would, that sort of self-righteous chatter and speculation and I would really try to to let that go. I didn't need to take that take that on. And the third one was taking responsibility for monitoring and working with my own energies and not letting them undermine or um, 
overpower my engagement with others. And this is really where the mindfulness, our mindfulness practice really, really came in for me. Um, that first foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of, of the body. You know, in the heat of debate, um, you know, or the, the adrenaline of the direct action, it is so important to really be aware of what's going on in the body, to bring the attention back into the body. And if I could recognize anxiety or agitation and mindfully stay present with that discomfort in my own body, I was much less likely to act out from a place of, of reactivity. And I just really consciously worked with this precept in um, pausing, breathing, grounding myself, um, remembering my intention to act in alignment with my deepest values. And when I was uh, working with this, I would often remind myself of a story in the Buddhist sutras as the story about how the Buddha worked with his young son, Rahula, who was um, a little, um, a baby monk, you know, a very novice monk when, when Rahula was a very young child. Um, the Buddha told Rahula that, you know, in every act of body, of speech, of mind, before you do it, think, is this going to harm myself? Is this going to harm another? Is this going to harm me and another? And you do that before and during and after. And then the Buddha said, you know, and if you think that you're, what you are going to do is not going to be harmful, but it has a harmful effect, that's when you really need to seek the counsel of those who are wiser. You need to admit it and seek the counsel of those who are, are wiser. And so this is why it was really helpful to me in my political activism to have other engaged Buddhist friends, people I could talk with about this and um, really um, find, uh, find some good counsel about how to work with with some of these uh, more confrontational uh, difficulties. Um, and um, it was just uh, because I was, was at this point being very public, now there were a lot of um, social media. One of the things I, I agreed to was to be active on social media. So um, you know, Facebook and um, uh, the newspapers and, um, you know, sometimes people I knew really well um, uh, really disagreed with me publicly. And sometimes in um, very, um, very sharp, uh, sharp ways. And it was also about really working with that energy that I didn't want to these are people who'd been in my home and I wasn't ready to throw them out of my heart. You know, so it was really, really working with my own energies. Um, and that's what really leads into the, the fourth precept, which is about um, skillful speech. So as I worked with this precept, I understood it as I would practice deep listening, even as I spoke my truth and acknowledge the limits of my own understanding. When we talk about skillful speech in a Buddhist context, it's usually speech that is necessary, that is true, that is timely, and that is offered in a spirit of kindliness. And so I really took this to heart. And um, 
was attentive to a lot of the, the work that's offered in um, nonviolent communication. I don't know if people here, I, I suspect some of you have been engaged in, in learning about nonviolent communication, where one of the things that you do in, in nonviolent communication is you're always listening for the needs under the speech, under what's said. What is the need that a person has in saying this? And as I was working on public safety, the needs that people often had were uh, you know, around um, issues of um, fear, fear for personal safety, fear about control. Um, and for a lot of times, people had a real fear of not being thought of as a good person being thought of as somehow racist, even if they, they disagreed with me. There's a real fear that I would think that they were, they were racist. So really trying to listen for what was going on um, with people. And, um, and sometimes, because I did a lot of phone banking, um, people would really just um, yell at me and um, slam down the phone. And it was, I just mostly, again, responded to the need that people had to, to be right in some cases. Um, and um, to express, um, express their anger sometimes. Um, and one of the things that really helped in, in doing this was, Whenever I would be on the phone with people, um, you know, I'd have a list and I'd see the person's name and the person's number and the system would automatically be dialing it. And I would just offer a little meta for that person. You know, I would say, you know, think, may you be safe and protected, Henry Jones, no matter what happens. And, um, you know, it, it just, um, that was really helpful. It was really helpful in, in, again, this not taking things personally and really trying to listen deeply. And um, it, it made it, uh, it made some difficult encounters. I, I never came away feeling really yucky about it. I mean, even when people yelled or slammed down the phone, um, it just felt, okay, that's, that's kind of how it is. And, and really understanding that my deep wish was for everyone to be safe and, and protected. Um, and the last of the, the precepts, um, the one that is um, sort of against intoxication, it's what made people often, often think about it. But the fifth precept is really the precept that helps us keep the other four. And I always understand it as um, I restrain myself from acting on any impulse that fosters carelessness in either sense of the word, being heedless or being heartless. And that to me was really important because it, it really made clear that what I needed to do, excuse me, as a practitioner was continually try to cultivate both wisdom and compassion. That, you know, for a long time, um, one of my, my meta phrases has, has been, uh, so, may wisdom and compassion protect us. May wisdom and compassion protect me. And it seems to me that that's really, um, such a, um, a safeguard um, because wisdom ultimately is an understanding into you know, the, the true nature of things. Sometimes in Buddhism, we, we talk about them as um, you know, impermanence, the transitory nature of, of experience, um, suffering, the unsatisfactory nature of experience, and um, selflessness, you know, the impersonal nature of experience, or Ruth King, who is a great writer and um, teacher. She's the author of Mindful of Race. 
uh, Ruth is very blunt about it. She says, life is not personal, permanent, or perfect. Get over it. You know, life is not uh, personal, permanent, or perfect. And when I could continually remind myself of, of that, um, it was really, really helpful. And again, here I would remember what um, the Buddha said. And he said that um, ordinary people, or sometimes it's translated as the common run of the mill person um, is intoxicated with youth and intoxicated um, with uh, health and intoxicated with vitality. Um, and that the, the more uh, spiritually sober person realized that um, we all age and that we all are going to have um, sickness and illness and we're all going to die. And uh, to think otherwise is to be intoxicated. And so, you know, when we have that kind of, of big picture, which is really what our practice um, encourages us to do, to always have this sort of larger picture. That's right. What do we have in common? We all age. We all get sick. We all die. That it That is a real um, safeguard from throwing people out of our, our hearts, that it really makes us more inclined to act with, you know, genuine compassion, really wanting the welfare of, um, of others. So um, I've been working with these, these precepts, not only politically, but I think they can also be really helpful in, um, in personal difficulties when we have conflicts, when there are conflicts in our um, communities, this idea of grounding ourselves in intention, the intention not to harm, in not taking things personally. Um, you know, you might just say, you know, your, your sweetie is just having a really bad day and you don't take what your sweetie, the sort of snippy thing your sweetie said to you personally. Um, uh, you know, you really work with your own energy. You really can, you know, staying with the body um, and being with the body, really working with those energies so that you're not lashing out um, because the body's uncomfortable, you kind of dump it on, on someone else. And then that listening deeply, really trying to understand what's being said underneath um, what, uh, what you might be hearing, what, what is really at heart there. And then this, this kind of um, grounding in wisdom and compassion which really just opens our heart to, um, to the world and makes it possible for us to, um, to sort of reconcile with each other, to be open to each other and to um, reconcile with each other. And so, um, and I have found that, that of the people that I um, disagreed with, um, that I am in kind of cordial connection with them in some ways that it wasn't it wasn't a, a rupture um, and um, and so I just uh, wanted to share this with you this evening and really invite your uh, your own um, thoughts and reflections on uh, reconciliation. I will also say, and, and I think this is probably an important caveat, that um, in sort of early Buddhism, there wasn't a whole lot of talk about forgiveness, but the idea was if you didn't wish harm for another, if you were able um, to, if you'd had a, a rupture with someone and you were uh, able not to wish that person to suffer for the sake of suffering, which is a very different thing than justice, but not that you want that person to to be hurt just to hurt, that 
that sort of was was sufficient. That idea of like letting go of wanting wanting ill for another, abandoning ill will. That that's often in early Buddhism what is understood as um, as forgiveness. Um, and you know, Thich Nhat Hanh and some of the later later Buddhists um, talked a lot more about uh, reconciliation coming together. And I think it's, uh, especially in personal context, I think it, it's always important to say that that first part, that, that first precept about not harming yourself, that there may be persons that you have encountered who have harmed you so viscerally or who have been toxic to you in a way that the most appropriate thing always is to take care of yourself and as best you can um, sort of let let the other go. But um, I think that sometimes the emphasis on um, reconciliation puts a real burden on people who have, have suffered grievous injury. So I want you to take this with with that caveat as a really important caveat that the, the most important thing is not to harm yourself uh, and and then not to harm others. But reconciliation is um, an ideal. It's something that we might like to work for, um, hope for, that hope eventually there can be some, some understanding, some coming together, some working together. But um, I just want to make sure that no one thinks that it's something that is sort of required in order to be a good person or um, that it's just another another task for people. It's it's an ideal that we can um, hope to work for, but stay with that in, in initial intention about not harming oneself uh, as as really key to um, engaging in any sort of, of, of reparative work. So with that, um, I would love to hear um, your responses, your questions, um, your stories maybe about reconciliation. So please just unmute yourself and um, contribute. It's always such a, a gift to uh, bring forth this kind of conversation. Yeah, I mean, just as um, you notice in yourself, and we all notice in ourselves, uh, the strength of our own conditioning. Um, when there are people who are acting in ways that I find reprehensible, one of the things I do is to um, reflect that um, they too have been conditioned, that they have uh, they have a history. Um, there have been causes and conditions that have brought about um, who they've become and and what they do. So that's just a way of of framing. It's not to um, excuse behavior or condone it in any way, but it's partly just this reflection um, that. Um, their conditioning and their circumstances were such that this has been um, the outcome. And then one of the things that um, I do that just makes me feel more compassion um, for individuals is um, I reflect on the fact that they are going to die and um, I think about them um, on their deathbed, and I wonder if they will be very frightened on their deathbed. And having having been with people who have died, both who have been more um, accepting, um, uh, embracing what was going on, and persons who were very fearful, there is something just um, heartbreaking about being with people who are dying, who are really afraid to die. And um, it's a little um, imaginative 
compassionate activity that I engage in, um, in uh, imagining that person might be on their deathbed um, and very afraid. And I know that in that moment that I would feel that I would feel uh, our tenderness toward them because of that, because that's such an awful place to be. And so, um, you know, that sort of, the sort of reflection that, um, that in some cases, some of us have had um, the good fortune to be with people who have inspired us, treated us kindly, encouraged us to make good decisions, or we found um, books that have helped us, or um, were uh, you know, what, whatever it was that that for you know the goodness in in each of us, if we reflect on it, um, we might be able to say, oh, you know, this um, this came from my parent, my teacher, or or I mean, we we can sort of um, see where a lot of those seeds came from. And with some of the things that are more harmful too, I mean, we, we can see that, that this has been um, our conditioning. And it has, has helped me when there are people whose behavior is, um, is just execrable um, to, to reflect on that. And, um, and to just, um, hold that this is the way things are this person's um conditioning this person made this choice that led to this choice that led to this choice um and that people are always acting in in a context that there are always um you know sort of of circumstances that um turn people one way or the other there's the famous um you know buddhist story of angulimala um, who was the um, bandit who Angulimala meant necklace of, of fingers that he killed so many people that there was this um, and he strung um, these uh, bones around his neck and uh, the story is that um, he needed to uh, one more and he was actually going to kill his own mother and the Buddha uh, intervened and he encountered the Buddha and the Buddha made him stop. Uh, and he, um, he sort of saw the error of his, of his ways. But the preceding story about Angulimala that I hadn't heard until more recently was about Angulimala being a really devoted student and a good person and how people who were jealous of him poisoned his mind and turned a teacher against him. And a teacher actually um, gave him this mandate that he should um, bring him you know, a thousand fingers. So, I mean, that's just sort of, who knows if that's the real story. But the interesting part for me is that there was a backstory that it wasn't that just Angulimala suddenly is this, this terrible person who is murdering all these people, but there actually is um, a backstory which talked about him being this very good person who was just treated, uh, betrayed and treated badly and, um, and became a terrible person uh, or did terrible things. So I think that, um, you know, when we look at some of these people whom we find their, their behavior to just be execrable and causing a lot of harm to just have this larger larger perspective about it which in no way condones what they're doing but to understand that that's um that there are reasons why they are who they are you know i think that that we are all in different um different places in understanding. And it's really important for me to, to remind myself that, um, you know, I, I may be really deluded about things and I, there may be a lot more, there is a lot more for me to, to understand. And it is really hard for people 
who think of themselves as good people to think, to see that they may have been complicit in a kind of harming. I mean, I don't underestimate how really painful that is to people because um, it's, it's identity threat. If your identity is that you think of yourself as a good person, um, and I think this is particularly true if you are an older person, for someone to say, well, you know, this is, you have really been complicit in this for a long time. And it, it is it is a very, very difficult, um, difficult arena, and there's a lot of hurt. So I think bringing compassion um, to that, and, and it's not to in any way, um, sort of uh, minimize your, your own beliefs. What I often say to people, if um, you know, I, I say, you know, we just see these things differently, or I've had different experiences. You know, we, we must have had very different experiences. Um, and, um, you know, um, tread, um, you know, let compassion be your, your, um, your guiding edge in this kindness and compassion. Um, truthful be truthful but you know as the buddhists you know it, it's is it necessary is it true is it timely is it offered in a sense of kindliness and those are really the conditions for skillful speech so um and sometimes it's hard to figure out if all those um uh, apply so it's the end of our time. So I will just um, share the merit. And again, thank you all for um, being here tonight. It is lovely to practice um, with all of you. And I appreciate your generosity in coming in and sharing. So this is my favorite um, Buddhist act of imaginative generosity. You know, we can just be extravagantly generous when we, when we share the merit. So if there's any goodness in our practice, any benefit, any merit, any blessing, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would give it to our teachers, our parents, our families, our friends, our spiritual community, we would share our blessings with the people we like and the people we don't like so much. We would share our blessings with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people that we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would happily, gladly, joyfully share any merit with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the slithery, the scaly, and the finny. May all beings everywhere find a path to peace. May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. So thank you all, and I hope you have a good evening, and please take care. Thank you.